I could bear. No, not one. Oh, God, my Father, God, my Father, I praise you. I lift my voice and say thank you. You who are the author, you who are the finisher. Oh, blessed and blessed and holy is your name. As the angels cry holy, I cry holy. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. bodies
you hear heaven and translate it to words we can hear and understand. Words that we cannot hear As you speak you speak the words of Elohim words that we cannot hear but you are the one that hears the words of our Savior makes it plain to our deaf ears that cannot hear those sounds of heaven. Speak to every heart in its own language, to every life, the words they need to hear in the language they can understand. You are the one that divide the sound of heaven of God himself. And divide it into all the channels, all the needs, all the words that each one needs to listen, needs to hear. Your words go through the deaf ears of those that cannot hear. Your words, Holy Spirit, they resonate even into the heart of stone. So that even the heart of stone can hear. And with those words become a heart of flesh. One word at a time. Your words that come from the Creator creates in us that heart of flesh. That I so desire. Cut through all the noises that fill our mind, our heart, even the noises from our body, from its pains. And you break through all that noise and you speak to each heart. What it needs to hear. Speak, Lord. Your servants listen. I listen. For it is you I have come to hear. It is you I have come to meet. It is you I have come to draw near.
over the noise of the world of situations, of problems, of questions. Because you whisper. break through the loudest noises that our soul can make. as there are. But how is it that men from every nation, every language, dialect, can clearly hear God? So what is that sound? We'll be looking into this a little bit today. There's a word that I saw, a verse in the Daily Light devotional that really came out at me, although I didn't, didn't really understand what it meant. So I had to really said, well, Lord, show me because I can't see what you want me to see in this verse. And the verse that called my attention was Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 23. And, and yes, I guess it makes sense. 
but I didn't understand really what uh, the meaning of it was. And this is a word that says, truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in God, in, in the Lord, our God, is the salvation of Israel. And I went over and over and looked in different translations. What? And uh, then the next, he says, certainly vanity are the hills and the multitude of the mountains. And the Lord, our God, is the health of Israel. And even though I want to read you now that same verse in Spanish. Ciertamente, vanidad son los callados, la multitud de los montes. Ciertamente, en Jehová nuestro Dios está la salud de Israel. Even though we speak English here in church, you probably noticed that in our service sometimes we speak in Spanish, we sing in Spanish, we pray in Spanish, we pray in English. And most times you'll hear voices in the background which are God-giving helps that are translating for those sometimes that are visiting us that do not understand English and sometimes even for YouTube video. But did you know that in Jesus' times, in the synagogues, they were also translating the services? Yep. Because you see, most of the people, if not all of them, in Jesus' time, they spoke Aramaic that was firmly established in Palestine as, as a language in the first century where Jesus lived. And Hebrew, in which the Old Testament was written, was basically for the learned. And uh, it was like a sacred language and it was for use because it was uh, written, the Old Testament and especially the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, was written in Hebrew. But people didn't understand Hebrew. And the majority of the Jews, especially those who were unlearned, or that were just workers, or like Peter, they just fished for since he was a child, the Hebrew of the Old Testament was unintelligible. And it was almost like the Latin that was in the church. Uh, they read the Bible in Latin, and the people didn't have any idea what it meant, but they didn't translate it. And when the scripture was read aloud in the synagogue, it was translated by what was called a maturgeman or a professional interpreter. Therefore, the name, the last part, Targum or Targumer. He was a translator to people to be able to hear and understand. And it, the, they paraphrased it, some, paraphrased it sometimes or just gave them the general gist of the scripture that they might not understand it just reading out like that. So, well, this is what it actually saying or give them the interpretation of that Hebrew scripture. Now, it's interesting that when Jesus, in Luke chapter 4, in verse 14, it says, When he returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, there went out the fame of him through all the region about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read not to hear, to read. 
And so they gave him, they delivered him, him a book of the prophet Isaiah that he asked for. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written. He literally, literally, they unrolled the book because the books were written on parchments or vellum, which is uh, the skin of animals. Now here, it really jumped out at me because we've been speaking uh, in the, in the uh, at Easter about the skin of Jesus who is the Word. I said, wow. So the Word was written on the skin of lambs of sheep, which is called vellum. And they were rolled on two rolls beginning on one end so that when they were reading, they would unroll it to the other side. And so he rolled until he found the scripture in verse 18 where it said, and he read in Hebrew, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to the heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering the sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So being what some might think an unlearned carpenter, Jesus could read Hebrew. In fact, in 2014, there was a news that made splash all over the world. It was the 26th of May and uh, the Pope Francis was visiting Israel, which was quite an important moment. And he was uh, greeted and welcomed by uh, Bibi or Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel. This was May 16, 2014. And Netanyahu said to the Pope, Jesus was here in this land and he spoke Hebrew. And the Pope interrupted and said, you mean Aramaic? And Netanyahu responded and said, yes, he spoke Aramaic, but he knew Hebrew. Mark records certain times that Jesus spoke with phrases and terms that were in the language of Aramaic, which was most of the people of the land. Jesus probably knew also a few words in Latin that were uh, the, the uh, language of the, of the Romans, and probably even a few words of Greek. But it was not a common language among the people. So he likely was not very proficient in all these languages, but enough to be able to make it by. But he definitely did not speak Arabic, because that language did not start in Palestine until after the first century AD. So Jesus' most common spoken language or mother tongue would have been Aramaic. He was familiar, fluent, even proficient in Aramaic and also three or four different tongues. And he spoke one of those language according to who he was talking to, what audience he was talking to, whether to a centurion, he probably would have referred to him in Latin. So in Jesus' times, Hebrews was very little, the language Hebrew was very little used, except in, in teaching the scriptures or even in worship. It was the, it was the, the, the religious language, the worship language, the word language. So like I said in Luke 4.16, he was showing reading from the Hebrew Bible at the synagogue. Now you've heard me quote many times uh, the things that are, that are written in the Targum. I mentioned the Targum of Jonathan and Targum of Jerusalem. So this, this is the same word that was used for those that would translate in the synagogue to the people what the Bible was saying, sometimes paraphrasing it. And so in these uh, Targums, the first one that we know of and that I've really used a lot was the one uh, 
where it speaks about the, in the first, the translation in the first five books of the Bible. So let's go back to the verse that I quoted in the beginning. Because I had to dissect and said, Lord, what, what is this scripture saying? I don't understand it. And when I went to the Hebrew, I could, didn't even think it was the same verse. These are the words that God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah. What language did he hear it in? How did he hear? What is the language of God? In Argentina, they say, in heaven, they all speak in Spanish. Here in the States, everyone's in, in heaven, everyone speaks English. When I go among the Chinese, they say, no. In heaven, they speak in Chinese. Maybe they even think God is Chinese. I don't blame them because in Argentina, when they hear God speak through his spirit, it, it's in Spanish. And here in the States, we hear in English. And the Chinese, they say, no, John, I don't hear him in English. I wouldn't understand him. I don't hear him in Spanish. I can't understand Spanish either. God speaks in Chinese. And yet it's the same word. So what did the prophet hear? Did he hear a language? Did he hear words in his mind? Now, I know I have personally heard what I thought was, was, was a live voice speaking to me in English when God called me and I was 16 years of age. I didn't know anything about listening or hearing God. And to me, it was perfectly audible in English. So the prophet was hearing God's living thoughts, not a language, not words, but sounds, thoughts. If we can even say th sounds, because sounds work here on earth where we have air to transmit the waves. But what is his voice? But he did hear. He heard the voice that he would recognize as the voice of God or Jehovah speaking to him and that sound that came to him, that living word was made somehow inside of him, made into know what it was saying and, and he put it into Hebrew words, translated into that. So God's thoughts that are heard, whatever those thoughts might be, or whatever sound that might be, God is spirit. So it must be something totally out of our realm of what God's voice is, if it even is a voice. God's thoughts are heard, and then they're interpreted inside of our mind so we can lay a hold of what, if not just a noise, a feeling, a moving, a, a, a tingling, or I don't know. Many of those things accompany when God speaks. Some people have a feeling, some people have a twitching, some people, uh, that sound produces something inside that's different than when you're hungry and where, when your body's telling you something or when somebody else is talking to you, just something about that that makes you say, and the more you're sensitive to it, the more you're aware that, hey, there's something here. Like when I saw that verse, I said, God's speaking, but I don't know what on earth he's saying through this scripture. So our mind grasps it and, and, and sort of makes sense of what he's saying. But how inadequate Words are to try to grasp something so huge as God's thoughts. It's very interesting that though we have a lot of words to be able to explain everything. For instance, talking about a thing. This is a thing, that's a thing, that's a thing, an object. 
or our stuff or our physical. Do you know that, that there's no Hebrew word for those things? When you look and say in the biblical Bible, Hebrew Bible, there's no, no such word for a thing, for an object, for some stuff, for physical, for everything is called one word that's used for everything. If you want to speak about molecules or whatever you want, is davar. And davar means word. Word. This is word. That's word. This is word. In Genesis, it tells us that everything that was created was created by God and by his word. Objects, everything. We read in Genesis chapter 1, 3, it says, God said, let there be light, and the object was formed, and light that did not exist came into being. It was created by his word. Now, did he say light? I don't think so. I have no idea what he said. But he said something, and that created light. Then he said again, he spoke again his word in verse 6, and a firmament was formed. And then he spoke again, and the vegetable kingdom was made. He spoke again, and the animals, the creatures, the birds, everything came into being. So everything was created, like Hebrews also said, like John mentioned, from the beginning was the Word. The Word was in God, and the Word was God. So we have words, and we think we're going to hear words from God. Maybe, maybe like the prophet Jeremiah, we hear something, feel something, intuit something, and that something becomes crystallized. That feeling which you cannot describe becomes crystallized into a thought. And we grasp it. And we make some sense out of it. It begins to, to say, oh, it's this or it's that. Directing us, do this, do that. So words, when we hear it, and we make sense of, uh, of an idea of what I'm feeling, it's a crystallization of that that's happening. And the word is what holds the world together, still up to now. It's that word, if you want to even use that, whatever it is that holds the world together, that holds the universe together, that holds gravity on our earth, that, that the planets rotate in their different ellipses. It's all held by God said by his word. John chapter one, verse one says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the word was God. Just, it doesn't make sense. It either is a noise like we know it, a word. But the word was, and it was with God, but it was God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace 
and truth. The only begotten was also the Word. But a Word made into something we could see, something we could hear. Because in Jesus, that the fullness of God was in him, all that, whatever that noise of God, if you can call it a noise, I don't know what word to use. His word was encapsulated in Jesus. So we could hear by seeing Jesus, by hearing Jesus, we could hear the words that he spoke that were coming from God's word. If you can make sense of that, please explain it to me after because I have no idea what I'm talking about. We beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. And the writer of Hebrews in chapter 1 and verse 1 begins saying, God, who at sundry or different times and in different manners spoke in times past to our fathers by the prophet. In different manners, in different times, he spoke by the prophets. So it wasn't they all heard in the same way, or they all perceived in the same way. In different ways, his word was understood by the prophets. So the prophets then were those that were called by God and were given a gift to crystallize, if that's a correct word, to crystallize that what they heard or felt and put it into words that we can understand. Some words so mysterious that even, even by reading the words we have no idea. It's a mystery. And he says, God, who in different ways spoke in times past to our fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, and by whom also he made the worlds. So, so now that even more difficult to understand, God spoke, his son heard what that meant, and he created light. He created the moon, the stars, the sun, the universe, by whom also he made the worlds. God said, let there be. His son made it be. But how did he know what it was? Let there be light. And he knew everything how to do that, how to create that. So what was in that something emanating from God? Were all the plans there? Were all the plans of genetics, the plan of physics, the plan, the plan of atomic structure and all that there? I don't know. I mean, it's beyond my pay grade. So, in what language does Jesus speak to the church? He doesn't speak a language. He speaks Davar. He is Davar. He is the word that encompasses everything. Everything that we might need to know to hear, even instructions of how to do things. Not just do this. I don't know how to do this. But then, oh, Eureka. I know how to make this. I mean, that's happened to me many times. I've gone to bed with a problem, 
I know I have to do this. I know the slightest I do it, I'll solve this problem. And then when I'm waking up, kaboom, it's all there. I can do this, put that, use this screw here, use this. And I can make it. I can do it. I can solve the problem. So if we listen carefully as the prophets, tuning out, first of all, tuning out our noise. We make a lot of noise. I'm not talking about when you ate some things that come out the wrong way making noise. I'm talking about there's so much noises inside of us and around us. But if we, if we can listen carefully as the prophets did, tuning out the noise to be able to hear strong, strongly the original signal, to focus on that single signal from heaven without all the interference from outside, we'll be able to understand and crystallize or pass it into a language that we can understand. So let us go back to the verse I quoted. I know it seems like I diverted, but no, now I want to go back to that scripture. And what I saw that scripture was actually saying. <clears throat> so let's look at it again. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills. Now, and from the multitude of mountains, truly in the Lord our God is salvation of Israel. First of all, truly is salvation hoped for is not in the Hebrew Bible. That verse starts saying the hills. Now, how did they get salvation comes from? Maybe because in the end, he is talking about salvation of Israel. Now, we might think he's referring to mountains as being like it is in the war, very strategic, because a better place to defend yourself in a battle. And you remember when the Philistines said, God is the God of the hills, and we can never win because they always have the advantage for us and everything else. And God said, no, I'm God of the valleys also. But when I begin to dissect this verse and look at the literal Hebrews words of this verse, this is what it says. The first word is alkane, which means surely, truly, indeed. It's a declaration that this is true. The next word is sheker, where we see surely in vain, it's, sheker means a lie, a deception, a disappointment, a falsehood. So he's saying, surely it's not true, it's false. The next word is gibah, a hill. Where we read that from the hills, he says a hill, not a mountain, lower than a mountain, and that word also means a place of illicit worship. That's what the hill was. That's the hill he was referring to. So surely it's a lie, it's a disappointment, it's a falsehood. That from that hill, which is a place of illicit worship, or we read, from the multitude of mountains. So we see now a mountain range. No, the word is harmony. It means a noise, a murmur, a roar, like of a cloud, a crowd, all speaking together, making noise. And then again, where we see truly, again the same word, Alcain, which is surely, truly, indeed, in the Lord our God, no, no, in the Lord, the word Lord is Jehovah. And then it says our God is not Jehovah, it's Elohim. The name given to the Messiah, Jesus. So they're saying in Jehovah, Elohim.
And where it says the Lord our God is salvation, the word is Teshoa, which means salvation, deliverance, victory, and rescue. Both personal, national, and spiritual. So yes, that's where they got to be able to do the first thing. Salvation comes from, because that's what it's talking about. Salvation, deliverance, victory, rescue. Personal, national, spiritually. And the last word is Israel. And Israel literally means God prevails. Because you know Jacob, his name was changed to Israel. I mean, because because he has prevailed. So when you look at this verse, this is what it literally says. Surely it's a lie, a deception. That a hill, that's a place of illicit worship and the noise, the tumult, the roar of a crowd. Surely, Jehovah, Elohim, is salvation, is deliverance. So he's saying that the hill, that place of worship, illicit worship, and the noise, the murmur of people, the tumult, the crowd, the roar. That's a deception. That's a lie. Truly, it is. Because Jehovah, an Elohim, His only begotten Son, His Messiah, Jesus, only He is salvation. So He's saying that the hills or the religion of man is no profit because it's just a noise. It makes a lot of noise. And when there's a lot of noise, we can't hear. So He's telling the people religion. Forms, liturgy, all those things that, that people do in the world. He says, all that is just noise that doesn't let you hear, that doesn't let, let you perceive that sound of God that we can latch on to, to a little bit like a prophet and said, God is saying this to me. God is saying that to me. But all the things that man does, trying to please God in our forms, liturgy, or even our services, are not profit. They are of no profit if it's just noise, if it's just things we do. So how important it is that we might come into his presence and not just form a religious structure that perhaps one day will not even exist anymore as the last days come. And the God of this world tries to destroy even the forms of religion on this world. I don't doubt that'll probably happen one day. So this, the form, is noise that so many times fills up and we cannot hear. We cannot be led of God. Sometimes we're forced into activities that, that put us in a corral, thinking that we're, we're uh, pleasing God by doing this, doing that. And it's all just making noise and we're not listening to what God wants us to do. The noise, so much noise, produced by the multitude of people, the kingdoms of this world, the nations of the earth, social media, news, propagandas, advertisements. Noise is going through the air continually. Plus the noise is Produced within us, 
the doubts, the questions, the roar, it's called. And sometimes the roar is so strong that you say, God, please speak to me. But the roar of things that need to be done, of circumstances, of problems, of the world, of what's happening, or even your physical, your physical roars sometimes. You can't even think of anybody else because it hurts. And I wonder, oh, could it be cancer? Wow! Big roar out there. We can't hear anything else except the C word. Oh, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And we cannot hear. It all covers it up. And so God says, it's, it's a lie, it's a deception. Those hills that make noise. But God, his word is there, has to stop speaking. We must try to somehow bring down that roar. Try to not listen to it. Try not to pay attention because not, if, we, if we pay attention there, we cannot tune in and let the sound of heaven begin to percolate inside of us. We can catch something, catch a thought, catch an instruction, catch a promise, catch a blessing, catch a direction, an answer. And he says, all this noise from whom many the Jews, God's people, have in vain expected salvation and deliverance from those mountains. It does not come. It's in vain. Don't expect salvation, deliverance to come through all that noise. Shout out, shut out, I'm sorry, all the noise and all the static until you be still and know that I am God. Jesus was surrounded by roars of a multitude of sick people, of demon possessed, but he always managed. When the roar ceased and people went to sleep and all was quiet, he'd go under the trees of the garden of Gethsemane, under the olive trees in silence himself, the roar subsided and he was alone with God. And the next day he'd been full, full of the word, full of direction. He'd go out and say, I know who I have to call Peter. And the other guy is under the tree. Yeah, he'd come back with direction that you can never find in the midst of activities, in the midst of the craziness of life. And life used to be simple. Now it's just totally complicated. A hundred, a thousand times more. So we can hear the word that was in the beginning and was made flesh. So we can hear the sound that Jesus is speaking even in heaven and as I pray today the Holy Spirit is the one that takes that heavenly word and makes it into things that we can hear. He is the Targum. He is the interpreter. He is the one that during the service, he hears, he said, what he hears, he will tell you. What Jesus has said, his words, he will make them known to you. He will remind you of them. So he is the one that's with us, that's in us, that gives us those words in a way that we can understand it. Not in a foreign language, but in a word, 
you hear a voice behind you saying, go this way, go that way, do this, do that. It's the Holy Spirit, that's the heavenly Targum, that to these unintelligent creatures, he is the one that interprets the reading of a Bible in a language we cannot understand. And he interprets it. Sometimes just in word by word, in other words, just paraphrase it. Let me explain it to you. Only then, in every circumstance of life, we'll be able to help the rescue, the help, and only then, that which comes from God, and the Holy Spirit puts it into words that we can understand, maybe not even words, thoughts that we can grasp. Only then, only then we can believe that it will happen. Only then, as is written in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, faith is a substance, something we can grab onto, literal. Faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And how can we have that tangible? Where God is intangible, untouchable, ununderstandable, uninterpretable? How can we, how can that become something tangible that we can grab and lay a hold of, a substance of things that we cannot see. Paul tells us in Romans, because 10, 17, because faith, that which would becomes a substance will come by hearing. And hearing will come by the word of God. When God speaks, we understand. The Holy Spirit speaks to us that we can believe what we've heard. Suddenly it becomes an object. Uh, several times in my life, I've, I've had that object in my hand. I can't explain it, but I know it's going to happen. It has to happen because it's real. It's real. It's tangible now. And that is by hearing. That word that comes from God that cannot return in void. Faith is born by hearing God speak. And truly, the Lord our God, Jehovah Elohim, is the salvation of Israel, the salvation not only of God's people, the Jews, but salvation of the Gentiles also. So then we can say, as Psalm 18, 2, I end with these words, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. May the Lord bless you with the ability that is not ours to be able to reach that silence, that silence where our spirit is listening where our antennas are all raised, directed towards heaven, saying, Holy Spirit, I know something's happening. I can feel something happen. I don't know why, but suddenly in the service, something happened. Please, Holy Spirit, interpret why I'm feeling God's presence? Why, or is this just something that happens in the service and we're just making noise? No, no, God doesn't make noise. 
He speaks directions. He speaks things that we can put into our thoughts, that we can grasp. It might be, I love you. It might be love someone else, as we heard this morning through Diego. But maybe it's something totally different. Maybe it's a different language for everyone, a different direction for everyone, a different answer for everyone, because perhaps your problems are totally different than the ones that are one that's sitting beside you. And that's what the Holy Spirit translate into all the languages of people that are listening. His word. Oh, I love his word. I love his word. May he make our hearts. Father, thank you for the word that made this world that we enjoy. Thank you for the word that became flesh. Because in him and in his words, we have life, life eternal. Open our eyes, open our ears, open our understanding, especially in these times, O oh Lord. When the noise of the little mountains that are around us scream because of the acceleration of life and the reduction of our time and the limits of our body and the weakness of our emotions. When exposed to all this noise, we almost break. It's too much pressure from our responsibilities, our works, the requirements of this world, the speed we must do things. Oh, show us. Show us. How to avoid the lies and disappointments of the hills. Show us how to be silent and hear. Teach us. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. You have so many times, but it seems like you have to shout before I'll pay attention or have to be in a problem or trouble or physical sickness or whatever in order for me to listen. Or a crisis. Show us how to discover that garden where you speak to man. Holy Spirit, thank you. So many times you try to speak and I don't pay attention. I'm too busy. Help me. Repeat it again. Cause me to listen. Cause me to hear when you're speaking so I can pay attention. Speak to me any time in the day or in the night. I want to abide in that listening position all day, all night. Wake me up, jolt me. But I need your creative, living word, your directions, your inspiration. Speak, Lord.
and your servant listens. Heal my inner ears that I might listen. Help us to go to our quiet place. Teach us to listen. Thank you for your faithfulness in coming. Even as we sing, even as we pray, thank you for intervening. So we don't try to change your presence, your voice, for things we do interrupt us. We bless you, Father. We bless you, Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. That is your presence with us. Hallelujah.